Welcome to A Simple Life. My name's Cal. Today we are going to talk about cut grazing. So what is cut grazing? Cut grazing is a method of using goats to manage land as well as to feed them that I have not found anywhere else on the internet. Not talked about or practiced long term. And why is it different than just putting your goats in the brush? Well, we have goats, we've had them for about five years now, almost five years. And during that time, I've learned a lot about feeding goats. I've learned a lot about what goats need. I've also basically, for the last four years, had a whole herd of goats that I didn't feed them anything other than maybe 10 bales of hay in the middle of the winter when we have snow. And so, when you can have a herd of goats and you can do that and you use them to manage your land, well, I say that's very successful. Now, the area I'm walking through right now, I've talked about in the past, used to be about 12 to 16 feet tall blackberry bramble, poison oak, and scotch broom. Currently, it's cleared out, and actually the goats have overgrazed it a bit, as you can see. Oh, yep, I'm about to get attacked by my livestock guardian dog. Hello, hello, I didn't mean to sneak up on you guys. All right, well, I've been properly loved by my livestock guardian dogs. Let's feed these goats so they'll stop nan at me, and then I can explain what cut grazing is. Well, how about this? I'll just show you real quick. One of the things I've done over the last four years on this property in particular is I've gone through and I haven't cut down all the wild hazelnut. This is wild hazelnut right here. The goats absolutely love it. And it was actually what I cut down first over there just to get the goats out of the way of where I was gonna drop the big leaf maple branches. And they absolutely love it. They go nuts for it. After that, the next thing I do is I pollard or cut back the big leaf maple. And I'll show you some images of what big leaf maple looks like when it's been cut down after two years of growth. And you'll be surprised how vigorously it grows back. This is about 12 feet tall at the peak. So these branches in here go all the way back. And you can see they're fairly thick and they have a lot of really good growth on them. So this is actually what I would like to have down in our woods is I like to have that main stem, main branch, and then around the base have a lot of this and let the goats just chomp it down every year. Every year they come through, they just chomp it down and it won't kill the tree, but what it will do is it will create even more fodder going forward. So between the root system and the main stem, the tree will basically continuously put out this bushiness and the goats will just continuously eat it down. That's what I mean when I talk about a perpetual feeding machine. These really can do that because you're not going to kill them by letting the goats eat all the brush off of them over and over again. So by doing what I just did here, this is actually going to create more feed for my animals over the coming years because big leaf maple will send out huge amounts of shoots. Right now where we had seven or eight branches, over the next couple years, we'll have 60 or 70, maybe 80 or 100 branches right here in this area. Well, then I don't have to come back here with a saw, which leads me to my next point of what I've realized while I've been doing this. Is if you do this method, you can't just walk away. You have to keep rotating your goats through the area because by opening up the canopy the way I have, like right here, this used to all be full, well now it's got a nice wide open canopy. That's gonna allow for more brush and stuff to grow in here. It's also gonna allow for grasses to grow. It's gonna allow for my dug fur to get bigger and healthier. And for me, that means money in the future because I use my dug fur as timber. 
by creating this perpetual feeding machine where the goats, their manure is gonna feed the brush, the trees, all that kind of stuff. And the brush and the trees and all are gonna feed my goats. Well, this allows me to have something here that's really unique. I'm mimicking what used to happen with the deer in this area. How do I know this used to happen with the deer in this area? Well, because I've heard about how big the herds were here from Herman. And that's what's great about having somebody that's been up here for 65 years living on this property. And considering this area was really only settled about the 1920s, well, that's half of the history of us living in this area. So that's pretty, that's pretty significant. In the past, we've had huge herds of deer in here to the point where Herman said when he moved here, he could go in the woods, he would find a deer path. Usually they were about a foot wide, eight inch deep rut where these deer just moved continuously. He would go, he would sit off underneath a tree about 20 feet, 30 feet away. He'd just sit there until a deer came along. He'd shoot it, take it home, and that was dinner. That is incredible. And that also speaks to the number of animals that were in this area because they say deer generally live in the same area about a square mile of where they're born for their whole lives. That's a lot of deer. My goats, there's 24 of them, haven't even put those kind of ruts in the ground. And they're only on 10 acres. So imagine the number of deer in an area, in a square mile area, to put ruts in the ground eight inches deep. That's a lot of animals doing the same thing over many years to do that, which is very impressive. But now we don't have that for multiple reasons. I've talked about this, people moving to the country, vineyards, big ag, all that kind of stuff. Me, people like me coming to the country, moving to the country, enjoying the woods, but also logging. That also changes the habits of the animals. So because of that, I'm trying to mimic this and I'm trying to study it. So let me show you the byproduct of what I've been doing. And while it looks an absolute mess, and it's gonna be a mess for a while, over time, I'll end up having a much better piece of land for my animals. So you'll see in the drone image, all these branches laying on the ground, the, all these small trees laying on the ground. And they go all the way up this valley here. So this draw or ravine, I've come in and I've cut down all the cherries. And I've talked about the cherries in the past and how they are kind of a trash tree. And they just make more cherries and they really don't do anything for your land. I left three of the limbs on this big leaf maple. The reason for that, well, is there's nothing here that that big leaf maple was gonna pressure. But at the same time, I didn't want it filling up this whole area because it did. This canopy's opened up because of what I did to that big leaf maple. This was all closed off. And I did that all the way up this draw because this draw is a perfect spot for me to run my goats. Now, right now, it's a mess, like I was saying. There's branches all over the place all the way up the draw. What am I gonna do about that? Well, nothing. I'm not gonna do anything about it. I'm gonna leave it as is. And what's gonna happen is two things are gonna happen. There will be blackberry bramble and that kind of stuff that does grow here. It'll grow everywhere, but that stuff will grow and the goats will come in and clear it out. The other thing that'll happen is this stuff, this maple, will all break down over the course of the next five or 10 years. Now, when I say five or 10 years, we're saying completely broken down and completely gone. Over the next three years, it'll dry out really badly and really become really weak and really start to fall apart. Look how good I have my goats trained. They think I'm over here gonna cut more stuff down. They want more than that, just that snack I gave them. Isn't that funny? Hey guys, that's it. We're done. I have a story for you. A couple years ago, uh, the Ronald Reagan Library was in danger of being burnt down because of some wildfires. The firefighters got up there and they realized, well, they weren't worried about it. They weren't worried about it because the Ronald Reagan Library had been paying somebody to come up every year with goats and eat all the brush. So when they got up there, there was no tender to help the fire spread to where the library facility was. Now, I'm not saying that this is not tender that a fire couldn't burn. Yes, this is all, when this dries, this is gonna be perfect tender for a fire to burn if we had it in the area. This is not, I have not made this better. I haven't made it worse, but I definitely have not made it better. But over time, it will be better. And so over time, I will actually have not only fed my goats, fed myself, 
managed my land, but I will also have built in some safety for all my infrastructure on the property. So why do I call this cut grazing? Well, I call this cut grazing because I'm coming in and I'm cutting down the undesirable plants, the invasive trees, the invasive brush that I don't want on the land or I don't want as much on the land. I want variety, but I just don't want like cherries. I'm cutting all the cherries down that are in the woods because they're not producing anything other than themselves. The big leaf maple, well, the big leaf maple is actually native to here. And so I'm not cutting it all down, but I'm managing it so that way I have healthy stands. So this is different than just putting animals in an area and them eating the brush. And what do I mean like by that? Well, I could show you areas that look like they have tons of food for goats. You'd be like, oh man, your goats could live for a month in there. Well, it's easy to say that, but once you put goats in, you very quickly realize that they probably can't live for a month. And let me explain why. Well, this is a great example. Okay, this hazelnut has no leaves that are anywhere lower than five feet on the ground. So when your goats come into an area and what you see is just nothing but brush, they come in and they eat everything five feet off the ground and what you quickly realize is the only thing that was five feet lower is the stuff on the edges. I did that one year. One year I came into an area, I put my goats in and I thought my goats are going to be great. They'll be good for like a month. And I noticed that they were eating the, the blackberry stalks. And I'm like, that's really weird. Why are they eating the blackberry stalks? And the, when I was coming up and checking on them, it was like four o'clock, this was winter, four o'clock in the evening. It was kind of dark out. I could see them, they looked good, whatever. Well, a couple weeks later, they started giving birth. Every single baby was a stillborn, every one. Every baby came out and was dead. And I, I started looking at my mom's and I realized that acre of land I put them in didn't have the feed they needed and they were basically starving. I learned a very valuable lesson that while I see food, if they can't reach it, it's not food. And I realized that if I was going to tame this land, the area that I was trying to work, I was going to need to come in and actually put things on the ground. And that's when I first started to build this methodology of how I was going to get the blackberry on the ground, how I was going to get the poison oak on the ground, how I was going to get everything that they wanted on the ground to feed them. Let me show you an example of this exact thing. See there's this blackberry bramble right here. It's up in this maple. Everything about five feet off the ground and lower has been eaten. Okay, all that, that's all about five feet or higher off the ground. Now, if I was up here on this, the top of this, and I'd be looking down, I'd be like, oh, there's still plenty of feed down there. But once I come down and I realize I'm 10 feet lower in elevation, well, that's not on the ground. And while if this whole area had blackberry in it, I would think this has plenty of food. At the end of the day, my goats have nothing. There's nothing down here for them. When I learned that lesson, a very hard lesson, I realized I need to do something different. And I started looking around like, what, what are other people doing? How are other people feeding their goats in the woods? Like, what is the methodology? What are people doing? And I realized there wasn't anything. And so I just started using dead or dying trees. For example, this whole maple is dead right here. I started coming in, I just cut the whole maple down and let it fall all in the blackberry, fall in all the poison oak and it would hold it down on the ground and my goats would come in and clean it all up. That was the beginning of me coming up with a way of feeding my goats off the land other than just letting them go out and eat whatever they could get. So it was way more food above five feet than below five feet. Can you just do a whole area and then walk away and never touch it again? Well, yes and no. Yes, you can do it, but you're gonna end up building up the same problem over time again because there's nothing pressuring that brush down. If you wanna have healthy woodland and you wanna manage it without having to get out there and spray and use chemicals or you don't wanna to have to get in there with machinery every couple years and just, you know, go through and mulch everything. Well, in that case, yeah, 
you know, you're gonna have to keep goats or have goats come in every year or so or every six months or so to really start managing the land. One of the other reasons why I love using goats to do this is because they drop an amazing fertilizer on the ground. They drop a pelletized little nugget of love. At least, that's what the dogs think they are. Do you think it's a little nugget of love? You do, don't you? I want a beautiful, amazing ground cover on my forest floor. And those pellets are spread all over the place. So all the little plants, the trees, they're all gonna end up getting those, especially the root systems for the trees. So just by having the goats within five or 10 feet eating, I'm fertilizing my dug first. I'm fertilizing my oaks. I'm fertilizing all the ground cover that are gonna be in my silver pastures. So for me, that's the other reason for using goats. As you can see, I got some of that blackberry lower and they stripped it right down immediately. There's still some over here. I didn't want to fall any more of this dead maple on top of them because I didn't want to hit somebody in the head just because there wasn't a lot of branches to slow it down. So it's just dead. So we'll get that on the ground at another point. But what we did today is pretty good. We thinned out this area right here. We'll get some more work back in there to do in another day. We got this on the ground here. We got a bunch down there on the ground. All right, well, thank you guys so much for joining us today on A Simple Life. Appreciate you stopping by. Hope to see you soon. Have a good one, bye.